Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for being here with us. I'm Beth Torin, uh, Interdisciplinary Cultural and Film Studies Librarian, and it's my honor to facilitate this session and introduce Sally Brown Deskins, who, as WB Libraries Exhibits Coordinator, is hosting this ser series of Zoom webinars featuring artists, curators, and collectors from the art in the library's exhibits and programs. So for this introductory session, um, Sally's going to present a brief discussion around the significance of art in times like these and the ways that libraries are engaging with our community online. So please note the session and your participation will be recorded and documented on the library's uh, website for public perusal. Um, and we remind you, that if, if feel free to speak to unmute and then mute again. Um, when you're done speaking. We'll be using anonymous polls throughout and at the end we'll share the slides and a link to an assessment in the chat. So, so during the presentation feel free to unmute your mic and or type questions in the chat box and I'll, I'll facilitate and share this with the presenter. And then following the presentation portion um, there'll be additional times for discussion and questions and we'll share a link to an assessment survey at the end. We're especially interested in your thoughts about content that touched you, anything that helped you gain awareness of a new way of seeing something or thinking about something, and kind of any takeaways or something interesting that you learned. So we encourage you to participate in the open discussion. And I, I was wondering if, um, we're hoping Karen, our library dean, is here. Is, she's here. She's here. Hi, Karen. Hi. Okay, yeah. and I'll, I'll hand it over to Sally. Thanks, Beth, and thanks everyone so much for being here. This is so much fun. Um, I can see the chat box, so I'm going to try to keep up. And if anyone, you can leave your, your um, speaker on if you want. If you want to slow me down, ask a question, <laughs> feel free to interrupt. And this is the first time for me doing this, so I'm a little nervous. So thanks for um, joining me on this introductory session for this new virtual program we're gonna do um, to introduce some of our artists and scholars and art and libraries um, that we do in the buildings and now virtually. So thank you. My master's is in art history from WVU, so this is like my favorite thing and pretty much just gushing about art the whole time. So here we go, thanks for joining me. So please let me know if you can't hear me as well. Of all the necessities we feel so aware of right now, the arts and their contribution to our well-being is evident and central to coronavirus confinement for those of us locked in at home. For some, there are more pressing needs, but momentary joys, even in dire circumstances, often come through the arts and collective expression. All right. As a mom, if my kids interrupt, you'll see, I'm a mom, curator, and lecturer in multidisciplinary studies. I constantly try to encourage myself, my kids, and students to find artistic perspective and appreciate different ways of seeing in this world of a plethora of online images. It's crazy to think about the amount of imagery we see every day. So this book uh, was a required reading in my undergrad as an artist. It's one of my favorite books I come to, back to time and again. You can also see this series of this guy presenting in the 1970s on YouTube, is an art critic, John Berger. He wrote in his 1972 book, Ways of Seeing, quote, we never look at just one thing. We're always looking at the relation between things and ourselves, unquote. This is more true now than ever. We're in an era where art is everywhere and free. The masses can appreciate art as the cultured minority once did. In this time of crisis and isolation, the role of art becomes more central to our lives, whether we realize it or not. We can easily take for granted the super abundance of media in front of us. Our consumption habits, including if not especially media, form who we are, our values, our inclinations. In this time of restriction, media offers us a chance to be mobile. Art connects us to new perspectives. And in our current context, it also connects us to a world where anything is possible. Galleries, libraries, archives, and museums are responding by offering virtual tours like this of the Sistine Chapel. I actually did this just the other day. It's amazing. I visited the Sistine Chapel when I was 17, but it was completely crazy crowded, and I did not get to see it the way I can see it um, virtually today. So I encourage you to check that out. And there's also an article 
yesterday in the New York Times featuring a bunch of different um, international virtual tours you can take that I linked here in the presentation. All right, somebody's familiar with ways of seeing. Cool, thank you. Did you like it? All right, there are also tons of online exhibits available. The Smithsonian Museums, um, right here, the National Portrait Gallery has a lot of great online exhibits as well as Google Art and Culture. I love the Frida Kahlo exhibit, it's amazing. I encourage you to visit it as well. I think there's another poll with that one. Beth. I am not seeing how to move to the next poll. Thea, help. <laughs> So I had heard of that guy, but I pronounced his name Berger. Oh, funny. Maybe that's right. I don't actually know. <laughs> Maybe I think you knew better, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we'll see if we can finish our polls. Um, if not, I'll just ask you and maybe you can respond. Um, oh, we're not seeing the polls. Let's see. Oh, wait a second. I saw something. If you click on the arrow up above, right next to John Berger, you can click on poll two and then click launch polling. So now I just posted the one, have you participated in a virtual museum tour? Does everyone see that? It came and went too fast. It, it showed up and then it disappeared. No. Yeah, it was there for less than a second. Oh, weird. Here it is. Now it's yeah, back. that's back. Oh. Okay, it looks like 13 people. Yay, cool. So it's about half and half you've participated. Um, cool, keep participating. <laughs> um, go back here, let Beth do that. Sally, can I, yeah. would you be sending out a, a, a copy of the, all these links to the different tours? Yes, at the end I'm going to share this um, slideshow which has, which where you see it's bolded and underlined, it's all linked. Um, on every page. So you can thank just, you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so museums are also challenging audiences to create work inspired by their collection. From home, like this challenge from the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, which I really enjoyed. I couldn't even pick one to share on this um, slideshow because there's so many that are funny. It's great. The other one I saw recently was museums are competing, showing their most creepiest objects on Twitter. <laughs> and I didn't share any of those images because they are very creepy, but if you want to check it out, I linked it on this slide. Oh, looks like one person has, or three people have participated in virtual creative challenges. That's cool. They're really fun. You don't have to be an artist. Um, I just wanted to mention that locally, the Tamarack Foundation, which is um, based down in Charleston, um, is doing a series of artist pictures outside their window or in their studio of West Virginia artists. Um, they're featuring, they feature Betty Rivard, which is one of our photographers that we have in the library, which is cool. And then the Art Museum of WVU also has their uh, Museum from Home series, which I encourage you to check out. And um, this artist based in Michigan does weekly challenges, including last week she challenged people to create mini versions of things found in their house. And that's my mini reproduction of Beth Von Housen's catalog, Resonate on the top left. Um, it's really fun, I don't know, has anyone Oh yeah, that was the same question. So good, a few people have, cool. So artists, museums, and other creative organizations are creating and offering free webinars and for artists and arts administrators like these uh, from Brooklyn Art Museum and QZM that I participated in. Um, there's also one I found in Pittsburgh by the Small Mall Gallery that I'm gonna participate in this weekend. Um, and then, yeah, we have a little poll here to see if anyone's participated in webinars. This is so much fun to watch. Looks like a few people have as well, so that's cool. I encourage you to, I've linked these um, here so you can check them out. And artists and curators are documenting and sharing their work online, sometimes live using hashtags, creating Facebook groups and collaborating and sharing experiences and work. Um, I had to, I, I don't think I can do a presentation without mentioning Judy Chicago, so <laughs> I had to share her virtual tour of her latest exhibit. Um, that's who I did my thesis on. Okay, so artists are responding in creative, dark, and serious or jovial ways, instigating shares and bringing art to the masses online, such as these famous paintings with figures removed. Has anyone seen any um, creative famous artworks? We have this poll here going now. I don't know if you've seen these. 
Um, there's a lot of Edward Hoppers going around that are fun. Looks like a lot of people have. If you have any to share, I'd love to see them. Please email them or however you want to share them. That's cool. Or if anyone can speak up and say <laughs> or post in the chat box. Or um, these displaying some famous artwork with social distancing. We saw this Frida Kahlo on a previous slide and here it is six feet apart and there's the screen. You can hardly see the, the figure there in the background. <laughs> um, street art has also emerged as an expressive form for artists right now across the world. I think I also did a poll on, um, on street art, but um, all these polls are going back and forth. I'll just keep going. <laughs> and creative masks. Um, artists have been not only you know, creating pretty masks, but using artwork and other inspired like creative materials to create masks. Oh, there's the street art. So some people have seen street art. I wonder if that's in West Virginia or outside West Virginia. I'd love to know about it and go look at it and take a picture. So please share with me. Um, oh, um, Sally, also yeah. um, Beth Royal says that she's colored some Easter eggs for neighbor children's egg hunts. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> Good idea. I love that. We should be documenting. Hopefully you're documenting that, Beth. <laughs> I um, think they already went to recycling. <laughs> and so it looks like, yeah, some people have seen street art. That's cool. Um, 11 people. Okay, no, I'm sharing the results about the, the street art. Yeah, I see that. Like um, about a third of the people have. And it's, Nick says, my girlfriend sews creative masks and selling them for 10 to $15. If you have a link, Share it. I'd love to buy one. <laughs> That's really cool. So, oh, Carrie um, Gunter Seymour says that Athens, Ohio has street art on their famous wall. Cool. Um, awesome. I'd love to see any pandemic inspired street art. That's really cool. Um, yeah, lots of masks. Cool. So of course, artists are creating relatable illustrations and comics shared across social media, inviting inviting and offering understanding and support through imagery and of course loads and loads of memes. Um, here's the creative mask poll. Yes, I think most people have seen creative masks. <laughs> that is cool. Oh, and Nick's sharing um, his girlfriend's email here on chat if you want to create a creative mask and I will be doing that. <laughs> That's cool. Um, I love this meme. Um, Purell earrings, girl with the Purell earrings, that's cute. Has anyone seen any creative memes with art, pandemic inspired, I'm sure. Sidewalk chalk in South Park, that's cool. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so what about libraries now? I think I take a break from polls for a few minutes. The library's main mission isn't one of exhibiting or collecting art. Libraries, along with galleries, archives, and museums, seek innovative ways to engage and evolve learning. I do have a poll. I forgot. Have you participated in any art and libraries programs? Thank you. As library content becomes digital and learning becomes more engaged virtually, exhibitions provide new ways of engaging intellect and creativity. Libraries evolve into a new sort of space, physically and digitally. Still a space for research, learning, and study, but also for community engagement and collaboration, presenting a unique opportunity for both collaborating artists and scholars and viewers. Ideas are protected and encouraged, and resources are a plethora in this neutral preserving space where some wouldn't normally seek exhibitions will find themselves. It looks like most of you have participated in our programs or our exhibits, so thank you so much. If you want to name where you've been in the chat box or what exhibit, that's cool. Um, WVU Art and Libraries program was developed in 2015 to showcase university faculty work. I think we have a lot of the founding committee members on the chat, Alyssa is one. It is expanded to be a program unique to the other art organizations on campus to provide true interdisciplinary cross-campus and community collaborative exhibitions featuring diverse scholarship and creative work through integrated designs and interpretive curation. Yay, Judy, the water exhibit, cool. Okay. The most recent example is Appalachian Futures, a juried exhibit featuring contributions of 50 scholars, practitioners, and creative artists from sciences to humanities and community organizers. As exhibits coordinator, I curated with the designer the, their multidisciplinary work together into a cohesive exhibition with themes specific to the space of the main campus, campus library, building on and challenging the boundaries of both publications and exhibitions. 
This exhibit is scheduled to travel to libraries across the region. Oh, Annie shared a pic of American Gothic COVID edition. That's cool. I'll have to check that out. Thank you, everyone. This is so fun. So there are some interactive features to Appalachian Futures and also some online features to the exhibit, including these posters that come to life with augmented reality by Reed College teaching assistant professor David Smith and the virtual YouTube tour of the speculative future section of the exhibit made by my intern who's here today. Thank you. Uh, there's also a soundtrack by Gangsta Grass linked on the Appalachian Futures exhibits page as well. And it's linked here. And I also have the QR codes at the end if anyone wants to try them out. Other examples include our many class partnerships, including a graphic design class who visits uh, the Appalachian collection of books in the West Virginia Regional History Center with Stuart Klein, and they redesign classic Appalachian book covers. It's really cool. They also have some painting classes that um, I grouped together some photos from the History Center's digital on view collection, and they create uh, paintings inspired by them. You can see this one here is from a group of um, photos taken in, in Russia in the 1960s and 70s, so they come up with really cool results. We also build on the functions of the libraries as a bridge of a community re resource and collaborative space by spearheading a public art guide. And we collaborated with both WVU and community arts organizations to put this together. It was a tremendous project that you can download on the Greater Morgantown and Visitors Bureau website. And we were also grateful to get a community engagement grant for that project. And in a time we find ourselves now, art libraries is creating online exhibits with many of our exhibits currently on displays in the closed buildings, such as the Health Sciences Professional Create that has about 10 or 11 health sciences professionals who create sculptures, painting, photography, and caustics. It's a really cool exhibit that you can find online, as well as other exhibits that are on our exhibits page. And my intern and I continue to create these online exhibits that you can also find in our weekly e-newsletter where we feature other virtual offerings, including ebooks and films and the History Center blog posts and more. And so, yeah, the West Virginia and Regional History Center. Here's our poll. Have you visited or used their digital archives? Looks like most people have. That's great. So you are familiar with them. They are also um, with the libraries, important holders and protectors of our times as documentary site, documentary insights. Currently, the center is inviting volunteers to document their experiences of this extraordinary time. WVU students, faculty, and staff of all campuses in WV Medicine are invited to submit open and honest personal accounts of their lives during the coronavirus outbreak of 2019-2020. These accounts, be they diaries, audio recordings, photographs, or scrapbooks, will help future generations understand the effect the pandemic had on our community. And you can uh, find and share it online in that link there. As a purveyor of information, the History Center staff members as well are creating blog posts highlighting their digital collections during this time to offer unique ways of engaging recently on topics of women's suffrage, cookbooks, and even coloring book pages from the archives. Be sure to check out the stellar blog posts about the archives from the 1918 flu pandemic. Um, that was 1918 to 1920. Worldwide it infected some 500 million people, about a quarter of the population. <clears throat> and the History Center staff has also been um, interacting with media, including WVU Magazine and Dominion Post. You may have seen those recent articles about the flu pandemic in the archives. So today in my world, my job continues. I'm an artist, as you might tell from my background. I continue creating and doing various webinars and social media creative prompts and hanging with my kids. <laughs> As I continue to work on developing our forthcoming exhibits be they online or in person when that comes, including undefeated, canvassing the politics of voter suppression since women, women's suffrage. And I think I have a few of our exhibits committee um, and art libraries committee members on here who've helped me put that together, put out the call. We received about 100 submissions, just made selections for visual work and our experts um, created content that will go along with the visual exhibition around voter suppression. Other upcoming exhibits include the 2020 Faculty Exhibit Awardee, English professor Nancy Caronia's interdisciplinary research on how the American dime novel genre assisted in spreading discriminatory notions of Italian immigrants in the late 19th and early 20th century, which is planned to open this fall as well. So I hope this presentation has introduced you to the significance in art in times like these and how cultural organizations and artists play a significant role in documenting, displaying, and engaging communities with archives, art, and scholarship. 
looks like we just had another poll. Have you picked up any new crafting or art making during the pandemic? Few people have, a lot of people have, and I haven't picked up anything new, but I am always creating, so that'd be me. So a lot of people, about even, about a third, that's cool. So, Sally, yeah. Uh, we did have a request to slow down a little bit. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Well, I'm almost done, <laughs> but I will slow down. Um, okay, so I originally planned to begin the famous master with famous masterworks created uh, influenced by former pandemics, the Black Plague and Spanish flu. I decided it was too glum so that I would end with it. <laughs> I can't help it. My background and passion for art and its significance compels me to share Dutch Renaissance artist Pieter Bruegel's The Triumph of Death, influenced by Black Death, showing an army of skeletons wreaking havoc upon a town's inhabitants and doesn't discriminate between rich and poor just like our current pandemic. You can see the fires burning, fish rotting, leafless trees, and a sea of ships wrecked. It's quite, quite uplifting. And modernist Norwegian artist Edvard Munch caught the Spanish flu in 1918 pandemic and created a series of studies, sketches, and paintings depicting his closeness to death. As we see here, Munch's hair is thin, his complexion is jaundiced, and he is wrapped in a dressing gown and blanket. Munch survived the flu. He lived till 1944. But Austrian figurative painter Gustav Klimt, one of my favorite artists, whose face fellow Austrian artist Egon Schiele, also one of my favorite artists, sketched on his deathbed in 1918 did not. Nor did Schiele, whose 1918 portrait, The Family, shown here, a future vision of himself and his wife with the child they were expecting turned out to be his last. However, on a brighter note, Georgia O'Keeffe became quite ill from influenza during the 1918 flu pandemic and took a leave of absence from her teaching position at West Texas State Normal College in early 1918 to recuperate at a friend's ranch in San Antonio where she painted the flag about her anxiety over her brother being sent to fight in Europe during World War I. O'Keeffe overcame the flu and lived till age 98. Of course, the impact of epidemics, fictitious or not, has been described in um, and experienced in the past in other arts such as music, literature, and film, such as Virginia Woolf's essay on being ill in her novel, Mrs. Dalloway. Art offers solace, sometimes a giggle. It also instigates resistance, change, and expresses the soul of our time. So in that light, we'll be documenting some artists in our time. The forthcoming presentations from artists in our exhibits invite you into a more personal view of their work and perspective. We hope you continue to join us. Thank you so much. Um, this artwork here is um, Carrie Gunter Seamer, who I think is here today. It's lovely work. She will be featured in our next um, online session. And so if you'd like to share any, any questions, I can go back. Um, if you'd like to share what you've learned or anything um, that touched you, any other responses, we're also going to post a survey. And yeah, feel free to open up your microphone or type in the chat box. We also have, the, I think this is the last poll that I did. <laughs> what was your favorite pandemic masterpiece mentioned today? Wow, it's pretty split. Of a few for the triumph of death, that one's very intense. A few for Shiele's portrait of Gustav Klimt. The masterpieces with the people removed. Social distancing. A lot of people like the girl with the Purell earring. <laughs> And a lot of people like the recreations using things at home. So I'm going to post the slideshow here in the chat box. Annie, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Oh, hold on. I'm going to exit this. Are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I was just wondering, you may have talked about this in your presentation, but is there any kind of like repository or anything that any of us artists in our WV community are can post about um, the COVID crisis and like artworks in response to the pandemic? You mean like locally, WVU wise, or just like a general publication about it? Just, I think, like, just kind of, I just keep seeing, like, social media posts and things, too. Um, I was just wondering if at WVU, if they'd talked about, like, having any kind of, like, 
virtual gallery of artwork contributed by the community or things like that. Um, like a place where we could put all the things that you were talking about, like the street art pictures of that or. Um, well, I, if, is there anyone here that works with the library's repository? I could talk about that. I was just, yeah. so this is Jessica. I don't work with the repository, but um, the West Virginia and Regional History Center is hoping to collect stories. And I think that they would also inc include artwork and those kinds of things from the WVU community. Um, if you go to the library's um, homepage, there's a link for um, a kind of a registration form to say that you're interested in participating um, and that the folks there will contact you um, to, to let you know more about it. But yeah, they are definitely looking for things from the WVU community that are happening around the, the pandemic. Hi, this is Debbie Borelli. I'm the Institutional Repository Manager here at WVU. Hi, thanks um, for being hi. here. Hi. <laughs> Um, we, the Institutional Repository would be happy to make a collection. Um, I think that we will probably try to work with Sally. Sally has several different exhibits um, posted on our repository, Research Repository at WVU. And I think that this would be something that we could work on together going forward. Um, and as a side item, we will probably work with the West Virginia Regional History Center also to do uh, projects together. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, that was a good question. Thank you. Did that answer? Or did you have? More yeah, questions? that's perfect. I'm still <laughs> really new to WVU, so I'm unfamiliar with a lot of the resources and stuff, so. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I, this is Beth Royal. I love that idea, Annie. And I'm thinking we have so many students that, like you, on social media, I've already seen them creating things and expressing themselves. And um, I'm just thinking if you or Sally or somebody even maybe came up with an example and then whatever platform we decide is the best way to submit it, whether it's the repository or the the Regional History Center's story collection, then we could promote that on social media um, as a way for students to, you know, share their, share their work for the future. Yeah, definitely. I think I saw, or I think my intern told me that the Graduate Studies is calling for, for art inspired by um, self-isolation, but I, I'm not sure. Yeah, they did like a few weeks ago, they had something on their Twitter I saw where they were calling for um, art submissions from graduate students. I think you could submit anything, so it was pretty open. But Yeah, thanks, Erin. I've got to get in touch. You told me that, and I need to get in touch with them. <laughs> Sounds like we need some coordination. We've got yeah. some places to send things. Mm -hmm. So both, uh, this is Debbie Borelli again, both the and I have um, posted the website URL yeah, in the thanks. chat box. Thank you, that's awesome. And I posted my um, slides as well. Um, any other thoughts, comments, questions? Uh, I think Beth is going to also post a survey. If you want to join our e newsletter, you can fill out the survey and put your email, um, or you can email me. My email's on the slideshow. Beth, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So as we wrap up, we invite you to assist in planning uh, future sessions. And by completing the brief assessment survey link, I'll put in the chat right now. And you can also use that survey to sign up for the art in the library's newsletter. Thank you all. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to spend um, with me and everyone today. Sorry I was so fast. <laughs> it tends to happen. But this will be recorded and posted on our uh, website so you can go back <laughs> if you really want to <laughs> check it out.